and welcome to another episode of Inspired by Yarra. This is a podcast that's been created to enhance, connect and inspire the Yarra Valley Grammar community and beyond. So wherever you're listening from today, thank you. Thank you for tuning in and continuing to contribute to the connection of our wider Yarra Valley Grammar community. We are on a journey today. I'm sitting down with Mark Garrett from the class of 1982 and he himself during this conversation acknowledges that who is he? Who is this little um, boy from Donvale who went to Yarra Valley Grammar to have reached the heights that he has in terms of influence, in terms of business, in terms of recognition across the world from time in Switzerland, working in Austria. Uh, He's been highly regarded and highly uh, awarded. He, um, the Austrian president, granted him the Grand Silver Medal with Star for services to the Republic of Austria. He is humble and yet a man of great influence. We were recording this uh, over, over the internet and there are times when there may be some delay in the audio that you hear. And, uh, but I'm sure our uh, technician, Matt Sibthorpe, who is a, a master class act of uh, tweaking the audio to make it as uh, smooth an experience as we can offer. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this conversation. Mark Garrett from the class of 1982. Here it is. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Inspired by Yarra. And as we do each episode, we sit down with another Yarra Old Grammarian. And today it is my privilege to sit down with Mark Garrett from the class of 1982. Mark, thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. Now, Mark... I'm sitting in downtown Melbourne, not far from Yarra Valley Grammar in Ringwood, but you are not. Can you tell us where you are right now? Yeah, sure. I'm sitting actually in my office in, uh, in Hamburg in Germany, uh, which is directly on uh, the river here. Very beautiful and unusually in the uh, wintertime, we have blue sky and uh, sunshine, which we don't always get in the middle of winter in Hamburg. Fair enough. And so, so you've got a, a window, a, an office with a view. I have an office with a wonderful view, actually, all over the, the rooftops of uh, Hamburg. Wow. And now I, I am excited to talk a little bit about your journey and, and how, how your foundation at Yarra has led to all sorts of adventures and, uh, and, and programs and, and views like that and many others. But I want to see whether we can go right back to... to 1982, and maybe even before that. Can you tell us what what year did you begin at Yarra and what year were you in when you started? Okay, I started, I don't remember the exact year, but I started in grade five at uh, Right, so down in junior school? Yeah, I started in the junior school and uh, went all the way through and uh, then I took, I had a year off because I had a rotary scholarship and went to Canada and then I came back and uh, did, it, did the uh, year 12 at uh, Yarra before going on to uh, the University of Melbourne, yeah. Right. So when you're in junior school, you're, you're wearing a red jumper. Do you remember a red jumper? Yeah, a red jumper. And I remember the, there was a red uh, a blazer. Yeah. And I think we had caps as well. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. And then uh, do you recall the graduation into a slightly different uniform when you went up into the middle school and then into senior school? Oh, that's, that, you know, now you got me. No, I don't remember that. I know. No. Okay. <laughs> did we, what did we change to? Long, well, long it, it trousers. Probably was, yes. <laughs> did you, do you remember wearing shorts? Yeah, 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 yeah. And did you, were you one of those who did the right thing and pulled your socks up or not so much? Oh, no, 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 no. Kept the socks down. Had good okay. legs. <laughs> <laughs> what about a Windsor knot? Did you uh, ever master the Windsor knot? Oh, I, I had to because my dad taught me. Okay. And, and, uh, did you play the trick where you would tie it once and then hope that that would last us a whole a whole term? Yeah, yeah. Kept pulling it over my head, but these days I That's I can still tie the Windsor knot because of my dad. Yeah. 
Uh, very good. Well, I, I'm sure he'd be very proud. And so would your principal of the time too. Yeah, that was uh, Cal Emmett, I think, in the junior yes, school. Yeah, that could be right too. Yeah. Very good. So tell me, what were some of your early memories of, uh, of Yarra Valley Grammar, whether it be in the classroom or in a specialist class? What, you know, Did you like to hang out on the ovals? Did you, did you like to hang out in the art room or were you up in the science labs? Where, where did you spend your time? Oh, I was mostly, <laughs> mostly on the sports fields, to be honest. So either uh, play a lot of tennis, cricket, football, uh, anything, that, uh, anything that involved a ball and running and chasing it. That, that was for sure. Uh, and, yeah, I have very, very fond memories of the, of the whole time in, uh, at Yarra because, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a very big campus. I don't know, have you still got the bush down there? The, or is that, is that gone now? No, no, you, you're quite right. The, um, the, the ovals have probably changed a little. There might be the extra court here and there and ma- maybe even a, a sports gymnasium area on the other side of the ovals, but then beyond that, the bush is still there. Okay, and there was, I think, and there were, if I remember rightly, there were two sets of tennis courts, one down near where the caretaker house was and then one set of courts up uh, towards, uh, was it Kalinda Road? Up uh, on yes, that side. that's right. Yeah, but I guess that's probably all changed now as well. Your your memory is serving you extremely well so far. Um, you're quite right. There were tennis courts both down down sort of near the bush, but also up closer to Kalinda Road. And and you are also right that the, the certainly the tennis courts up near Kalinda Road have been replaced by. Uh, new buildings. There's a, uh, a a senior primary building up there for the our year fives and sixes, and then not far from that is uh, our new maths uh, math science building. So uh, certainly we've you would notice some progress. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that means we <coughs> that means we're not going to produce any French Open winners because I think the the courts up near the uh, Linda Road were clay, and the ones down on the other side were hard court. If I'm right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so they had the options. Options is good. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, do, now, in any particular field, any sporting pursuit, do you remember a particular match or game or tournament where uh, where there was a memorable moment? Maybe you took the best catch of your career, or maybe there was a goal you kicked after the siren. Is there any special I do. memory? There is actually had? one match that stays uh, stuck in my mind. Uh, because uh, I was playing actually for the um, – so at the end of the tennis season, the, the associated grammar schools played against the associated public schools. So there was a, a representative team, right, and I was picked uh, to play for the grammar schools and we were playing against the public schools. And uh, I had to play against a, a, a good friend of mine – uh, called Mark Hartnett. I think he li- still lives now in uh, Park Orchards. And Mark actually was uh, the number one uh, junior in Australia and the, I think he, he won the Orange Bowl and stuff like that. He was very good uh, uh, mates with Pat Cash because we all grew up together and played at uh, Everdale Tennis Club. And, uh, yeah, I remember that match because that was the only time I ever beat Mark. <laughs> I remember that. Congratulations. He remembers it too. We still talk about it to this day. <laughs> uh, well done. That's that's terrific. Well, and uh, what was your uh, what was your weapon? Was it your big serve or your uh, cross court backhand? What was the uh, oh, what was, was the winning? It certainly wasn't the backhand. <laughs> it was the, definitely the serve. Uh, serve and the forehand. Backhand. I spent most of my time trying to run around. <laughs> uh, very good, and and we do have uh, some very very talented tennis players who who have gone since your day, and uh, and even still today, we've got some uh, good tennis players who are gracing the courts. The courts might be a little different, but uh, the tennis is still good. Yeah, no, that's good because that was you know it was very unusual. Like I think the public schools normally beat us in most of those sort of combined things, and that was one day where we beat them, and there was. Uh, searching back to think of the guy who was the coach. Anyway, the, the teacher who was the coach was extremely happy. I remember that. Christy. Uh, You're right. What was his name, Christy? No, 
they're definitely good stories to come back to the staff room with. I, I uh, and and for you back to uh, back to your mates. Tell me, um, what was it like out in the uh, out in the yard, like at lunch times? What sorts of things did you get up to when it was sort of that relaxed time? Oh, we were normally. I mean, we were just mucking around, uh, playing. Uh, knocking a tennis ball against the, the wall or, you know, it was always activity. Was, so, you know, physical activity, doing something. I don't know what the – I've got three sons, so uh, they were also fairly active, but uh, I think they're probably a bit less active these days than, uh, than we were then because, you know, they have other – you know, they've got their smartphones, their iPhones, all that sort of stuff that we didn't have any of that. So you had to make up your own activities, right? So there was always a football. I mean, mum was always uh, giving me a hard time because I was going through pairs of uh, trousers like there was no tomorrow. You know, you'd fall over and rip open and then she'd try and sew it up. And then, because, you know, uh, I think my parents spent a large portion of, they had three kids, they spent a large portion of their income sending those three kids to, to school, right? And <laughs> she wasn't too happy when I'd come home with the trousers ripped open. No, fair enough. And and I dare say she probably had to sew on a few extra buttons from time to time. Yeah, yeah, yeah all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and we used to yeah. catch the bus. Do the buses still come and, and pick the kids up at the end of the school day? We used to catch the bus then back home. Yep, yep, we lived, we, we're still at... We lived in Donbass. Yeah, Bay. right. So the bus is still for sure. Yeah. Um, what was home life like for you? How, and, and how did you get to Yarra, was it walking distance, or did you do you hop on hop on a bus to get yeah, no, there? We how how the did bus. you travel? Yeah, we lived over in uh, we lived over in Donvale, so we had to walk up uh, to the bus stop in the morning, and that was always a good opportunity because uh, the but near the bus stop was a was a milk bar. Do you, do you still have milk bars? Pro- probably not. Yep. But uh, and and you could you know buy something, some licorice or something, and then jump on the bus and uh, off to school in the morning and then uh, bus ride home in the, in, the, uh, in the evening, in the afternoon. But most of the afternoons were taken up with sports activities, right? So you were normally anyway, over, we'd go over to Heatherdale uh, Dennis Club for, for, for training uh, with a guy called Ian Barclay. And I, like I said, Pat was there, Mark Hartnett was there, a whole bunch of guys from the old days. And we, we still all catch up with each other as well. Once a, once a year in, uh, in London, we catch up. Some of us, just depends on who's around, but it's, it's quite good. And uh, what about your academic pursuits? Did you uh, enjoy being in the classroom? Was there a particular, uh, I, I guess, department that you would spend time in? Were you in the art room or were you uh, knuckled down in the library when you uh, weren't out kicking the footy? Where, where did you hang out and I, enjoy being? I, 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 you might want to ask some of the, I don't know if anyone was still around, the teachers from back then, but I guess I wasn't, I wasn't uh, at that point in time, I, I wasn't particularly uh, academic. I, uh, I did, uh, you know, I did okay and did all the stuff that I had to do. Uh, it really wasn't until I got to uh, Melbourne Uni that, uh, that, that I knuckled down and uh, then uh, really started to push more on the academic side. But at school, you know, I enjoyed English, for example, and, and did, uh, did uh, quite well at it. I got through my math and uh, chemistry and stuff like that. Uh, the irony is that we had languages, so we had uh, German and Indonesian, and uh, you know I learnt a little bit of schoolboy German, a couple of words or something like that. And uh, if I'd actually known that I was going to end up living in Austria and Switzerland and Germany, it might have been useful to have put a little bit more effort in. But uh, now, in the meantime, I'm fluent in in German, but I could have. Could have got off to an earlier start. Absolutely, and and maybe that might have been might have even contributed to a, an easier journey. To you know, I think it's easier to learn when you're younger, isn't it, in yeah. terms of languages? Absolutely, absolutely, and and you know, I don't know, like in in Australia, you underestimate uh, 
the importance of languages, right? Because you can get on a plane in Melbourne and fly for five hours and you get off in Perth and, and you say, g'day, mate, and, uh, you know, the guy answers you, g'day, mate, right? It, it's not an issue. When you, you know, if you fly five hours from, from Hamburg, you're getting off a plane, you know, somewhere in the Siberian forest or something, right? And, and you've gone over probably four or five different language borders just to get, to get there. So you underestimate that. And uh, it's really important because if you can speak other people's languages, uh, the understanding for each other is much easier to create, right? If you don't speak the other people's languages, uh, that's a real struggle. My wife speaks six languages. You say six languages? Yeah, she speaks six languages, yeah. Tell me, um, if, if you were, had the opportunity to speak to a, a group, let's say a group of um, year 10 or year 11 language students, and, and uh, whether they're learning Chinese or Japanese, they might be learning French or Indonesian, what would be some guidance or advice that you would have for them? Well, first, actually, you know, treat it uh, seriously because I, I think um, it expands not just the, the mind but the horizons and, uh, and then my advice would be travel because the best way to learn a language is actually go where it's spoken. And uh, my wife and I, have a, we had an agreement from the day we met that uh, we would only speak German with each other. And my German, when I met her, was okay. But now, you know, with, with that, it, it, uh, it became <clears throat> really, really good because you're using it every day, right? And languages are meant to be spoken. That's, they were originally, they were a spoken means of communication before they became a written means of communicating, right? And, and so it's a important travel. If you enjoy that, travel, get out and, and meet people who use the language. And I'm always amazed. So my, my wife speaks English, German, Spanish, Italian, French, and Portuguese. Yeah. So she can, she's really useful whenever we go traveling because sometimes I can't read the menu and she helps, you know. And, and without uh, comparing and, uh, and um, paling your own um, journey into insignificance, how many languages do you speak? So I speak two and a half. So I speak German and English and a, and a bit of Spanish because uh, the kids all speak... Uh, Fluently, so they did the International Baccalaureate and they did it trilingual. When you do the International Baccalaureate trilingual, you actually have to take an extra subject, right? So normally you take six subjects, so they took seven subjects to be allowed to do mother tongue English, mother tongue German and mother tongue Spanish. And uh, it was really, yeah, it's, it's a total enrichment because the parts of the world that they can go to with those th three languages, it's, a, it's amazing, right? They've yes. So it really does open up the, the possibilities and with confidence they can travel into those environments and, and feel quite comfortable. Yeah, they travel, they, they travel all through you know, Latin America, all, all through uh, Europe and even Asia. They don't speak an Asian language, but English is the second language in many Asian countries, right? Yes, yes. That's tremendous. We're speaking with Mark Garrett from the class of 1982. And, uh, and Mark's tuned in from Germany. What time of the day is it over there where you are, Mark? It's, it's about 8.30 in the morning now. Yeah. What time is so it where you for, are? For me, me recording, it's about 6.30 at night. And I, I reckon we, we might be at least a day or two ahead. Yeah, I think you're a day ahead. You, you guys always know what's going to happen tomorrow, which is quite. I always tell people Australia is the only country in the world that they know they know what's going to happen tomorrow today. I don't know why you don't make more money on the stock market. That's right. We we should be uh, moving even further ahead if that were the case. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
Mark, school can have a strong influence on our character and our outlook on life. And so I wonder whether you might reflect on on the bigger picture experience of Yarra and how that might have influenced your values. I think Yarra, you know, like I I was always uh, probably one of the uh, one of the kids who was pushing a little bit uh, the boundaries. <clears throat> I've been a bit like that my whole life. And so I was always uh, probably stretching the uh, patience of the, of the teachers to a certain extent, right? And uh, I always remember that there were people there uh, like, uh, like Cal Emmett and there was a guy whose surname was Christy I can't remember his first name, Doug Christie or something like that. And they always uh, they always showed uh, patience and understanding, even for some of the you know stupid things that I probably did. Uh, you know, different things that schoolboys get up to that you probably shouldn't get up to, but nothing like uh, illegal. Just uh, things that you. You know, supposed to kick the football on the football field and not not uh, not in the car park, and then you break a car window or something like that. You know, things 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 like that, and uh, and it was the patience and the understanding rather than uh, you know severe punishment. And I think that that's you know I've learnt that I got now at the moment. At the moment, I've got about uh, twenty two thousand people working for me and uh, I find people react much better to patience and understanding than they do to, to the whip, right? And uh, I think uh, that came, that was what I learned also at Yarra Valley. I mean, I also reacted better to that because that was, his name was Les Christie. When Les, so, you know, Les Christie showed this patience and understanding and as a result of that, I felt also like obligated to to do something for him and i know there was the old grammarians uh used to have this uh tennis competition in melbourne and so i got to and les was a very keen tennis player and uh so i got together a bunch of of old grammarians and we won the uh, you know the top uh, section of the uh, uh of that uh league uh one year and yeah, put put a big smile on Les's face, right? And that made it was you felt like you were giving something back to the guy, right? That that was yeah, that was that's one of the key learnings for sure for me. That's fantastic, and and I love that you can recall all the way back then those key or some of the key figures in your life had an influence on you and not, as you mentioned very clearly, not through force and not through fear, but they were leaders. And now if I just heard that correctly, you're leading an organisation with 22,000 employees and you are not out there to be fearful, but you are a leader and patience and tolerance and um, nurturing are sort of the values that you apply to your role. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's really important because it's actually two organisations. So I'm the chairman of a company in the states on the New York Stock Exchange, and then I've got uh, this holding company that I run in in Hamburg. So the holding company in Hamburg has uh, a bunch of <coughs> a bunch of companies and has about seven and a half eight thousand people, and the company in the states has about uh, fourteen thousand people and yeah I find everywhere I go so it doesn't matter right whether it's in the states or whether it's in Europe or whether it's in Asia people react better to that type of leadership than they do across all cultures and all uh, you know languages and everything people react better to that type of leadership yes yes Mark what what should I be calling you? What is your title? What is uh, what is the role that you play? H- how should I be addressing you? Just Mark. <laughs> Mark's fine. That's that's how everybody addresses me. That's another part. Of, I mean, I don't like the sort of formalistic, you know. So in some languages, it's, it gets very formal, right? 
So, you know, I, I was uh, made a um, sort of like, uh, um, I don't know what it's called in, in Australia, the equivalent of like a member of the Austrian Empire or something like that, right? So I, I was given the grand silver medal with honor and star and sash. So if I ever go to the, when I go to the Opera Ball, right, in, in Vienna, I have to wear, I've got this, like this medal and this big silver star on my hip and this big sash going across, right? Uh, this is very important uh, in, in Austrian uh, society, but uh, no, just Mark is. Uh, and that's the same here. I think I'm the CEO and president of the, of the board here in, in Germany and chairman in, uh, in America, but yeah. I don't stand on any of that stuff. Tell me a little bit more, would, if you could, about uh, the Grand Silver Medal with Star for, um, for your work and service to the Republic of Austria. Tell, can you tell us sort of the, the journey toward that and, and what you were recognised for? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, some, sometimes these things happen. You know, life, you, you, you come to decision points and you take certain decisions to go one way or the other, so... My, my wife and I were, you know, talking about where we wanted to live and, and what the job I would do. And I had a couple of different job offers. And one was to run a company in, uh, in Vienna called Borealis. And Borealis was owned uh, 36% by the Austrian, uh, the Austrian oil and gas company, OMV, and 64% by one of the big uh, sovereign wealth funds in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. And uh, I went there and <clears throat> the company was more or less sort of a, a company that in good years made some money and in bad years lost some money. And, uh, but it was a, it was a diamond uh, in the rough that just needed some polishing. When we finished after 12 years, 11 and a half years, the company was uh, the country's biggest, most profitable company, was the country's uh, biggest taxpayer and was the country's biggest dividend payer. So we were paying dividends. And I think the last dividend that they paid was more than a billion euros. Uh, and uh, of course, we invested a lot of money in research and uh, development. So we were also Austria's uh, uh, most research intensive company with uh, the most patents every year and uh, a really good uh, employment record and, and you know, were, were known as, you know, one of the best places to work and, you know, we won a lot of Awards, I think even, oh, where is it? Just a second, I'll bring this in for you. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, just for those who are listening at home or whether you're out on a run or you're in your car, Mark's just stepped back from the microphone momentarily to pick up a uh, couple of um, medallions and it looks like a, a, is that a news cutting? Yeah, this is a news cutting out of the uh, <coughs> Austrian uh, newspaper and it just, it just says that you know the the company is uh, the best company to work for in Austria, and uh, it says here Borealis is uh, the most profitable company in Austria, uh, and uh, has won the award to be also the, the best uh, the best uh, <coughs> company to work for. So after after doing all of that, and don't get me wrong, because I didn't, I didn't do it by myself. There was a, you know, there were <clears throat> thousands of people working for the company, and there were some really, really uh, brilliant people. Uh, the government took the decision to uh, to give me this this award uh, when I retired. So I retired uh, last year, and then. Um, 
or after about two months of retirement, uh, my, my wife got a bit tired of it, so uh, I had to go back to work. So that's how I'm, that's why I'm in Hamburg and why I'm also working in the States now. Yeah. <laughs> wow! Very well, short congratulations. Very and, short retirement. Uh, it, you must be very proud of the award, and and I appreciate your humility in acknowledging that there are thousands of people who contributed to it, but that's that's tremendous. Those people need leading. Those people need guidance. Those you know, you've got to make the big decisions. When you're in, whether you're the chairman, whether you're the president, whether you're the, the seen as the boss or the CEO, nowadays or then, what is a normal day for you? How how do you go about your day? Are you up at a particular time? Are you have some routines and rhythms that you um, that you follow to help you be, whether it be more productive or more centred or more um, focused, or what? What are some rhythms that are part of your life? Well, I mean, the first thing, if you want to do these types of jobs, right? The first thing is you need a really, really good assistant because she's the one, he or she, is the one who's organising your your life. So not just not just your day and not just your work day, but it's your whole life, right? Because you have to imagine at the peak of my uh, travel uh, time, so when I was really, uh, when Borealis was really uh, blowing out all of the lights, I was traveling 750,000 miles a year. And uh, that's about, depending on the plane and everything like that, that's about 850 to 900 uh, flight hours a year. And pilots at, for example, Swiss Air are only allowed to fly 800 hours, right? So I was flying, literally flying more than the pilots. And when you're doing that, you need to know when you get off the plane, there's going to be someone there to pick you up. You're going to get taken to your meeting. You're going to be on time. It needs to function like a like a Swiss clock, right? And uh, so the people who are organising your life are really, really important. And the reason I say also your life is because you've also got a family, right? And they, they need time as well. So it's much easier if that is organised in in total rather than trying to keep the two things separate because it doesn't work when you try and keep them separate. So my day normally, here now in Hamburg, my day starts, I get up at about uh, yeah, quarter past six in the morning and I'm lucky because I, I have a place not far from the office, a nice 20 minute walk into the office. So I walk into the office each morning. Uh, then I take a, I take a uh, natural yogurt for breakfast and uh, drink about uh, three quarters of a litre of uh, water to start the day. Uh, then, uh, then it's just gonna be meetings. I don't have any meetings before nine o'clock in the morning. So I normally get an hour at the start of the day just to, to get everything, you know, organised off to a good start. And uh, then it'll be more or less meetings all day and I try and make sure that we build little little gaps in between in case one starts, you know, one goes a bit longer than expected or whatever. And then uh, I normally stay in the office until uh, eight or nine o'clock in the evening and the evening time I use to actually clear out all of the stuff uh, that's built up during the day. And then uh, and then it'll, it'll be, you know, a dinner. Uh, there'll always be dinners. I, I don't think I've used the kitchen in my apartment once in the last year and a half. I haven't even cooked, I don't think I've even cooked water in it. Um, because when you get to these types of uh, companies, um, so, like, like uh, Borealis in, in uh, Austria, there's other demands on your time. It's not just running the company, you know, it's like the, you'll have meetings with the economics minister or the chancellor, uh, 
the Chancellor used to take me with on, on some trips to different countries. If we had big investments in some countries, then I would have to go with, uh, with the Chancellor when we go to these countries. And um, uh, so it's not just running the company, do you know what I mean? You're, you're in, you get a much broader uh, responsibility than, um, than just running the company. Yes, that, that's a fascinating insight into, um, to, I guess, to be honest, a world that most of us would never actually um, be demanded of. You know, we, we're not going to see that. We're not going to be part of that. Are, are, you, are you working, uh, whether it, it was at the peak or even now, is, that a, is it a five-day-a-week or is it a seven-day-a-week responsibility that you hold and you carry, um, or are you able to switch off at times? I. I'm lucky because I can switch off and I sleep well, right? So that's that's important. Um, but it's the job is seven days a week, right? You get days. People try a lot of people try to respect weekends and things like that, right? But just to give you an example. This Thursday is a public holiday here and uh, I'll be in the office working. Nobody else, but I just can knock off the backlog. Then I'll fly down to Dusseldorf, catch a car over to uh, Maastricht because our middle son uh, graduates with his law degree on Friday. So I've got the Friday off instead of the Thursday. And then on the Saturday, yeah, back to Dusseldorf for a meeting even though, and then back to Maastricht uh, to spend the rest of the weekend with the family. But, you know, it, it, you, sometimes you can't, you can't make everything work Monday to Friday. And especially, you know, when I was, when, when I was uh, running Borealis, it didn't work anyway because the Arab world, their weekend is Friday and Saturday, right? So they're working on Sunday. Now, they're, not, they're pretty respectful of the fact that Sunday is, is actually our, uh, you know, uh, religious day, right? Because theirs is Friday. They're pretty respectful of that. But still, there's a lot of stuff that sometimes happens on a Sunday because they, their work week starts on a, on a Sunday. So I was often in Abu Dhabi on on a Sunday. I mean, I was flying to Abu Dhabi anyway uh, 14, 15 times a year. So sometimes you were there on a Sunday and you, you just have, you, 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 that's what I meant really with your, your life gets um, integrated, right? And, you know, my, my wife probably wouldn't have gone to Abu Dhabi in a, uh, in her life, but then when but we got married, and you know that, and then I got that job, and and now she she goes regularly down there, and uh, she's got friends there, and she gets invited to uh, you know local weddings, and and uh, she she was just there a couple of weeks ago, and and she was having uh, dinner with with uh, one of the ministers, and she probably would never have done that. Do you know what I mean? So it really take it starts to take your whole life, not just not just your work life. It doesn't get separated very easily. But uh, I always insist, you know, you should take you should never just take one week's holiday. One, uh, one week's holiday is is not enough because you 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 go, you start to wind down, and then you have got to start to wind up already again, right? You should always take two or three weeks holiday. And when I go to Australia. I always take uh, you know three weeks. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and so what you're saying really is, if if you're willing to embrace the the job and the task and and the the responsibility that goes with it, and and in your experience at least the travel and the people that you'll meet, if you if you embrace that then it's actually going, there are going to be many benefits that are going to take you to places that otherwise you wouldn't get to explore. Mate, I, you know, you were talking about it before. I mean, I was sitting here thinking, how did a 
boy from uh, Donvale, you know, get to do this. I mean, I've got another picture back here. And show it. I'll just show it to you. So this is, this is me here. This is Dan Jurgen, who won the uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize, uh, you know, for, for literature, right? And this is, uh, this is Sheikh Mohammed, the uh, crown prince of uh, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, right? So without a doubt, you, and that was, that was on the front page of the newspaper uh, a couple of years ago, you meet people who, you know, you've got to scratch yourself and go, is this, is this real or is this like a, a fairy tale or a film, you know? You don't, uh, you, you would never have, growing up, kicking a football in the uh, car park of Yarra uh, and, you know, breaking a car window uh, and getting Les Christie giving me a hard time, uh, a nice hard time. Uh, I don't think if you'd told Les that one day this would be the... He wouldn't have believed it, right? He would have said, no way. <laughs> not, this, not, this, not this kid. So, so tell me, can, can answer the question yourself, how does a boy from Yarra Valley Grammar get to meet those people, have that influence? Are there characteristics that you have developed or is there a work ethic or are there, I mean, I know you talked about patience rather than uh, fear, if you like, as a leader and, and not dominance rather than um, being on the journey. But what, what do you put it down to? I mean, clearly you... you have an, a way with people and you you've you have an ability to make the numbers do what you want them to do or you know what is the what is it about mark garrett that that makes him a little boy from yarra valley grammar go and be you know such an influence for so many people it's remarkable we're very proud i i, I don't think you know what i i, I really believe that you should let your results speak for you, right? I, I don't like um, people who, uh, you know, are boastful and, and, and things like that. And I think the, the results spoke for themselves. And I never, at the beginning, I, I, I didn't give any interviews, um, I, except for, you know, the year-end uh, results conference and the quarterly results, uh, stuff like that. But I never gave any interviews about, about myself. And, uh, and I still don't, you know, this is an unusual situation for me now, talking to you about, about what's happened. And I think that certainly in, in the Arab world, so Sheikh Mohammed and, and my, my, you know, and, and the guys who I was working for, you know, the, the energy minister, Suhail al Mazuri and, and uh, Sheikh Mansour, they, they were very happy to, they respected the results and, and, and they knew that they could trust me and, and rely on me, right? And I think that that was, uh, that was really important um, for them. And through that, through that consistently delivering over a number of years, then, of course, uh, other people started to, to notice those things and then you started to get more and more... Uh, involved in other things and people ask you sometimes your your opinion on things and I would always say look you know sometimes they ask you your opinion on things that you have no idea about right and you're not really qualified to to give an opinion so I would always tell them look this is just this is really only what I think I have no basis for I, I this is not a problem that I can I can solve because you know my my uh, field of uh, expertise is, is somewhere else. And uh, they respected that. They always respected that. And they respected um, the fact that you weren't uh, pushing yourself. Uh, people can tell when people are trying to push themselves, 
you know, you get a lot of those people in the, in the world. And uh, I think let the results speak for themselves. And, and uh, then if you can help people some, somewhere along the way, that's fantastic. We set up a, I, I believe very strongly in social uh, capitalism and, and we set up a, uh, a uh, <coughs> fund, a, a social fund, 1% of the net profits of, of Borealis were paid every year into the social fund. And uh, we did some fantastic projects all over the world uh, that were helping uh, people in, uh, uh, you know, more difficult circumstances uh, around, around the planet. So giving something back is, is also very important, I think. Uh, it's wonderful to hear someone who has, you know, done so much and, uh, you know, and, and achieved so much, but also appreciating the value of uh, contributing to others and helping and supporting and nurturing others, not only your own staff, but then beyond that as well. And, uh, and well, that's a beautiful thing. Paul, you know, just the, the best thing that I ever did just to get that in before the end of the podcast the best thing I ever did was uh, with with uh, four friends. Uh, we built a school in uh, in Switzerland, and it's the called the International School of Basel, IS, ISB. And uh, that school uh, now educates about uh, 1,300, 1,400 kids a year. So that every time I drive past that school, I. I I'm always very, very happy that we that we did that. Yeah. So we built that school, and uh, uh, we got all of the big companies in in uh, uh, some of the big companies in Switzerland to to fund the the building of the school. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and I suppose what happens is when you get to be working at that level with people of influence, with a particular size of your purse then you can start to influence for good, can't you? Because you know how to tap into the resources. You know that other big uh, corporations and other big businesses, they've got a certain desire perhaps to make an impact as well. And so you can start to, um, I guess, pull those pieces together where many other people wouldn't have that opportunity. Yeah, no, that's, that's for sure. And what you, what you can always do is you can link things, right? <clears throat> so when expats get moved somewhere, there's, there's normally the job they want, normally the salary and everything is fine. There's two questions that have to be answered. One is housing, where are we going to live? It's got to be right for the family. And the second one is where are the kids going to be educated? So we could go to the big companies because we had access to the people at the top of the big companies. And we could explain that by building a school, we were gonna be helping their companies to solve one of the two fundamental problems when they were bringing people into the, into the region of Basel. And the CEOs of those companies like Hoffman La Roche uh, and uh, Novartis and um, <coughs> uh, Syngenta, Clarion, they all understood and so they were willing to, uh, to commit to helping to build the school. So you, you make the link. You know, they, when, it, when it makes sense to somebody, then, it, then it's much more likely to, to happen, right? It's the same. I, I'm always trying to promote uh, wherever I go also, you know, recycling. And, it, and it's not just recycling for the sake of recycling, but recycling because it makes absolute it makes absolute sense. I sit on the board of a company in, uh, <clears throat> in Brussels called Umicor, and they're the world's largest supplier of uh, materials for the uh, rechargeable batteries. And they're the world leaders in metal organic uh, chemistry. But their most profitable business is actually uh, a, a specially built smelter that recycles all sorts of metals. So 17 different metals go through this smelter 
And what they're recycling is, you know, motherboards from computers, iPhones, all this sort of stuff is going in one end. And a very complicated process, but out the other end comes gold bars, silver bars, palladium, rhodium, all these precious metals that are used in these pieces of equipment. And I bet you at your place at home, if you went through every room, you would find a whole bunch of old phones and old computer bits and old televisions and stuff like that. And if you put them all in a, you know, in a, a container, there's a lot of precious metal in there. And so the recycling makes absolute sense. And uh, so I push it everywhere I go. And I know in Melbourne, because I read the Age newspaper religiously every morning, and uh, I know Melbourne has a big problem with recycling, right? They're, they've really got it completely wrong. And, and it's actually a really important, I mean, none of this stuff that's going to landfill should ever go to landfill. It's completely wrong that it goes to landfill. It's economically wrong, environmentally wrong. It's just completely wrong, you know? Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, I'm not sure, you know, certain levels of government, or, or they, they tell us that they've got a new plan and we've got, we're going to be okay, but I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that we really have got it sorted just yet. No, no, it's, it's a, well, you've got probably the wrong people involved to, to one thing. And some of the stuff I read, <clears throat> I know is actually like chemically or, or physically, you know, it, not possible to be done, right? Because because I've invested, you know, in two uh, big uh, recycling facilities here in in Germany, where we use the world's leading uh, technology, and I sit on the board of that company in, in Brussels. So I know what what the current state of technology can do, and what it what it can't do, and what the next steps are according to the to the research. And uh, I read some of the stuff in the newspaper and go, no, no, guys, that, that's not going to work. You've got to do it this way. But, you know, maybe one day I'll get a phone call and they'll, they'll ask me to come over and help a little bit. You never know. <laughs> well, I hope, they, I hope they do give you a call because I reckon you might be able to tell them a thing or two how, how to do it. <laughs> yeah. 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 But we need to do it. And, and that's especially, you know, with the electric vehicles coming, uh, Umicore has just invested in a, in a pilot plant to recycle the batteries, which is technically feasible. So when, when in about 10 years' time there'll be so many batteries coming back that recycling of batteries will be a big business. It'll be a huge business. So there, there are companies who are ahead of the game and they, they're preparing now for... The, the, the future, which, you know, thank, thank goodness for that. Yeah. No, because it only makes sense if you can recycle the batteries. It has to, that, that way you close the, the, the circle. And uh, we're doing a lot of work with uh, Formula E, you know, the alternative to Formula One. It's the electric uh, formula. And uh, their batteries go back to get recycled. And um, we're doing a lot of work with Porsche and VW uh, on all of the battery, making the batteries and then recycling the batteries, yeah. Mark, you've been wonderfully generous with your time and sharing your, your expertise and your, your perspective on um, the world and, and what an amazing journey as the, the little kid from Donvale who pulled on his shorts and came along to Yarra Valley Grammar all those years ago and, and now has has opinion and, and it sounds to me that your opinion has, uh, your, at least your willingness to share your opinion uh, and be honest about that has, uh, has really uh, been one of the catalysts that has earned your respect and regard and, uh, and your influence has continued to increase and, and that is a marvellous thing. And so on behalf of Yarra, if, if I'm in any position to be able to say, we are delighted to be able to not only hear a, bit, a little bit about your story, but also to, to share in some of the, the congratulations that you so richly deserve, although you would humbly say there's many other people who uh, have contributed to the success along the way. But congratulations from everybody at Yarra. 
Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate it. But you're 100 percent correct. I mean, the um, success comes from a huge group of people, right? Uh, and getting them. I guess the biggest skill is getting them all going in the in the same direction. And when you do that, then then really unbelievable things can happen. And that's so the credit should go to everybody, right? It's it's always a it's always a team effort. Exactly the same as uh, the rugby. <laughs> which we lost uh, to England. I mean, if you look at what Eddie Jones has done with England, it's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know that uh, you mentioned before as, that you have an assistant who helps to keep things in order and keep things online, and every now and then there's a little bit of fat built into your day so that you can run overtime, and I appreciate we're, we're all but running overtime yeah. on our time slot here today. So let me ask you uh, really, really quickly um, five or six questions that I want you to give a one-word answer to. Okay. And, uh, and we're going to dip back into your experience and your time at Yarra. Uh, what house were you in when you were at Yarra Valley Grammar? Arnott. Go Arnott. Do you remember a particular musical performance or a, a play that you were either part of or enjoyed while you were at Yarra? I can't remember the name. It was one of those Western okay. musicals. I remember the musical but not the name. That's okay. Um, if you had the choice, what's your preference, house swimming or house athletics? Athletics. Okay. And uh, describe what would be a standard lunch for you back when you are at school. <laughs> Vegemite sandwich. <laughs> it's surprising how often that comes up, I can tell you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I still eat Vegemite now. Ah, very good, very good. Tell me, what, uh, Mark, what was your first job? Uh, I worked... Uh, I worked as a, uh, in a bank, part of a bank, uh, for 12 months whilst I was at uni. Yeah. In all your travels around the world, what is one place that you would highly recommend that people add to their bucket list and what is one place that you are excited to go and see one day? I look, I, I love the Swiss Alps, so absolutely magical. So if you ever get a chance, you know, go there because it's really, it's really something special. And then uh, where I would really like to go is I want to – Take go. There's a you can organise these boat trips around the northern parts of Australia, northwest uh, Australia, into these coves and and things uh, with the cliffs and stuff. It looks absolutely magnificent. I've seen pictures, but I've never done it. Wow, what's one thing you miss about Australia? Ah, oh, every time I go, look, there's lots of things I miss. Uh, Mum and my my brother and sister, but. Uh, also silly things like twisties and uh, football. I love Australian football. Uh, I'm a big uh, Essendon supporter. And uh, unfortunately, they haven't done so well the last 10 years, but uh, they seem to be getting themselves back together a little bit now. And uh, cricket I can go to see because I go over to London to watch the cricket. And, uh, and I can watch the rugby, but Australian football doesn't travel so well. Mark, my final question is uh, if I was to offer to you the phrase Lavavi Oculus, it's our school motto, and uh, I wonder if, if A, do you recall what it means, and B, what does it mean to you now? Well, if, if, if I'm right, uh, it's uh, to like levitate or lift your eyes to the, to the horizon or whatever you want to call it, right? And, uh, and thinking now, just have you asked that question, it almost describes my life because I, live, I saw possibilities beyond the ones right in front of me and, and was able to go much further, ab ab abroad much further away than I probably ever had thought possible. So, yeah, it's very interesting to reflect on it, isn't it? 
Mark, it's been terrific to wander down uh, some of those memories and uh, and some of those journeys and trips. And uh, so thank you for your generosity of, of your time and your expertise. And uh, we're very proud of you. And uh, we thank you for uh, shining the badge of Yarra internationally. And uh, we're grateful that you uh, have been inspired by Yarra and continue to be an inspiration. Many, many people will listen to this conversation and uh, and they too will will acknowledge that yeah, maybe maybe some little kid from Yarra Valley Grammar can go out and change the world. So congratulations and thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate it, really. Well, there you have it. I told you he was an extraordinary character, humble and yet received accolades and mixed with people and interacted and had, you know, the opportunity to rub shoulders with some world leaders. Such an intelligent man across all spectrum and he's had success in uh, many different avenues, as you just heard. Seems to have a pretty good balance. <laughs> and and even the notion of trying to retire a couple of months and then straight back into it and, uh, and a very, very busy man. So we were delighted that he gave up some of his time early uh, on a workday morning and, uh, and was able to share that experience with us. So we're uh, rapt to have been able to speak with Mark Garrett. If you want to continue to stay in touch with all the things that we're doing here on the Inspired by Yarra podcast, you can head over to uh, yvg.vic.edu.au and in the community section down near the bottom, you can find the YOG podcast, the Inspired by Yarra podcast. And in there, there is a growing library of episodes of people from all generations who have been Yarra old grammarians and uh, they share their story just as Mark has done. Uh, The ups and downs and the twists and the turns. My name's Paul Joy and on behalf of everyone here at Yarra, I want to wish you another day of inspiration where you, with intentionality, get out there and make a positive impact in the world around you.